Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of IGT Sunday Conversations. My name is Justin K. Prim. If you haven't been here before, I'm going to be your narrator for the evening or your guide as we talk to Richard Wise about writing and books and adventures and gemstones and all sorts of good stuff. Um, if this is your first time here, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for giving us your time. This is our, let's see, uh, ninth Sunday in a row. So we've had a lot of great conversations, as you can see from our flyers. Um, and I'm excited to do, to do tonight's. We're going to get into some good stories. Um, this is the second to last of the IGT Sunday series. I've got one more coming to make a nice even 10. Uh, and then I have some other... I have some other stuff planned for next month for interactive video stuff. So um, welcome everybody. I see that we've got people from all over the world as usual. I always appreciate uh, seeing all the different countries that people are saying hello from and, um, and yeah, we're gonna have some fun tonight. So I guess uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Richard, if you are ready, I'm inviting you to jump in video wise. And we'll begin. And let me hold on one second. Let me. Uh... Hello. Hello. How are you doing? <laughs> I am good. Thank Welcome. you very much for your inviting me to your uh, your series. It's I'm, been a pleasure. I'm uh, real excited. I'm excited too. Where are you at right now? It's looking beautiful back there. Well, uh, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, we have a we have a home there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, such a beautiful day i decided rather than uh, rather than talk to you from my study um or from the library i thought it might be fun to be outside because i know though for you those of you in bangkok probably uh wouldn't dare go outside and uh, yeah no it's an interview. I, well actually you know it, the rainy season started pretty much in the last week so it's cooled down quite a bit but but the last two months of quarantine it's been incredibly hot, you know, like in the every day in the high 90s to the hundreds from the time you wake up to the time you go to bed. So the rainy season is always nice relief from that. But uh, yeah, as I can see for you, you're in a totally different kind of uh, environment. Yeah, it's a uh, spring. Uh, summer starts here around uh, mid-May. We mm -hmm. open the pool and things are good until about uh, the end of October. I've been in Bangkok in June, and I don't, uh, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. You can't wear you can't wear long sleeves or sweaters here ever. So you can, you have to just try to be cool without without layers, really. So okay. So anyway, Richard, please uh, for anyone who doesn't know who you are, or if if by some weird chance they haven't seen one of your books at least in passing, can you give us a little bit of idea about who you are, what you've done? and uh, give us an idea about why we're talking here today. Okay, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm a graduate gemologist. I've been active in uh, the gem trade uh, and the jewelry business since about 1980. I'm re I retired in 2012 to write, uh, but um, I've written two books. The first one is called Secrets of the Gem Trade, A Connoisseur's Guide to Precious Gemstones, which that came one. out in 2001. And to my, uh, to my great, uh, great happiness, became a bestseller. And uh, the second edition came out in 2016. We did a major revision and rewrite and added about 11 new chapters to the book and brought out the second edition in 2016, and that is Selling Briskly. Uh, my second book was called The French Blue, yep, and it's set one, in the, se there you go. <laughs> uh, the French Blue is set in the 17th century gem trade. What I basically did is I took Jean-Baptiste Tavernier's book, The Six Voyages, written in 1678, in which he chronicles his six trips from France to Persia and uh, India to buy diamonds mostly, although he also dealt in pearls and colored gems. And uh, I took his six voyages, his chronicle, and I turned it into a novel. I added a bit uh, 
but basically I fictionalized the true events of his six travels. Uh, and my, I was very interested also in any hints that he dropped about yes. quality in gemstones and pearls, I made sure to integrate into the narrative. So as my wife says, if you really want to know the secrets of the gem trade, read the French blue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually the French blue, I just, I just finished reading it a couple of, I guess a couple of months ago. And it was great. You know, for me as a, as a gem cutting historian, uh, I haven't yet delved into actually reading Tavernier, like actually sitting down with the English translation and reading it through. I thought uh, I'll start with this because this one had been recommended to me before. I think maybe two or three years back and someone in Tucson, and I was having dinner and they're like, have you read the French blue? You know, this is totally up your alley. And I was like, no, I don't know about that. And then I looked it up and I realized, oh, it was by you. I, and I already had one of your books. So then I said, okay, it must be good because the other one was good. Uh, I wanted to share before we're going to talk about both of these books and, and other projects and stuff as well. But before we get started for just as a small way of introducing this book, which is your your, I guess your most well-known work. I know for me, whenever I first came to Bangkok and uh, I had just finished gemology school, I, I finished gemology school right at the time that I met Vincent Pardue here in, in Bangkok. And mm -hmm. he, he had invited me to go on a trip with him. And I, and he was kind of like, you know, coaching me, you know, I, I was just really new to Bangkok, really new to the trade. And I said, Vincent, you know, what's the next step? I just got my, I just finished school you know, we're going to go on this trip. How can I prepare myself? He's like, you need to get this book, Secrets of the Gem Trade. That's, that's my number one, like, rule for you right now. You have to go read that book first before you do anything else. And I was like, okay. And so I, 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 I would just happen to be going back to the States at that time. So I ordered it, you know, just ordered it to my mom's house, picked it up, took it to Tucson. I think that was the first year I ever worked at Tucson. And I read started reading it in Tucson and then took it back to Bangkok and finished it. And uh, now we have two copies in the house because my wife had one too. And when we merged our library, now we have a hard cover and a soft cover. So uh, I guess you could say we're big fans because we have many copies, but it was a really good book. And, I, and actually when I was, I was speaking to Vincent earlier this week, cause you know, we have a, we have a Wednesday series that we do that where we're interviewing people as well. And I was talking to Vincent and saying, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm interviewing Richard Wise, you know, remember you when you told me to all that all those years ago to get that book. And he's like, Oh, yeah, you know, actually, he told me he, he told me his own anecdote, which was the reason why he likes the book so much as a non native English speaker. He said, this is the perfect book to understand all of the gemstone lingo, when you're not a native English speaker, like for him, he's French. So to learn all these trade words that we use all the time, it, it takes all the mystery out of it and you can see all the sort of definitions. You can see how you're using the terms. Um, of course, you can see the whole system that you've used for grading quality and everything. But for him, I guess what he really liked was the fact that you had laid out all these terms and used them. And for a non native English speaker, I never even thought of it this way because you know, these this is not a challenge I had to overcome, but for him and for other French and whatever other speakers he speaks to, he often recommends that book for that reason as well, just to get a, handle on the trade and the vocabulary of the trade. And I thought that was quite interesting. Well, I try to write so that people will understand. You know, a lot of people who write, uh, I did, my background is in philosophy. I did graduate work uh, in philosophy uh, back, back in the day. And you know, you read a philosophy text and it seems like the guy is trying to obscure <laughs> he's not trying to explain. He's trying to show you how smart he is. And he's using every big word he can in order yeah. to do that. The yeah. result is you don't have the slightest idea what the son of a bitch is talking about. <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to hold this up for somebody that asked for it. The French blue. So, I mean, yeah, there's a couple of hundred copies left. It's also on, it is on a Kindle book. And okay. it's on Smashwords. So it's in almost every ebook format, but there's only about 200 uh, hardcovers left if anybody wants them. Uh -oh, so. They should be there becoming collector's edition because they're getting increasingly rare. Yeah. So clearly I was just, I was just sort of leafing through the secrets of the gem trade over this weekend when I was thinking about, you know, what I wanted to talk to you about for this 
conversation and and i i hadn't looked at the book in a couple of years and i and you know once i'm looking at it again i see how just how well done it is you know how how thorough it is it's almost like a perfect accompaniment to anyone's you know sort of gemology like if you know for me i've got all the gia books my wife has all the gem a you know course books and then this book fits so well with that stuff because it's laid out like a, almost like a textbook but not it doesn't read like a textbook you know it, it, it's like you said it's simple and clear but it's just the the quality of the the paper is so nice i mean it just feels like a really nice um kind of reference book something that you'll go back to over and over again and clearly i mean for anyone who's read this or seen this book you must have done so much research and 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 had so much experience before you could even attempt to write such a book so can we kind of go back in time a little bit and just figure out how did you get to the point where you were ready to write this you know what what, what was your background before you started writing any of this stuff you said you were a gemologist but what else was going on back then well and i started in essentially in the winter of 78 I'd been a professional community organizer for 10 years. And uh, I'll tell you, it's a burnout profession. So I was looking for something interesting to do. So I started working with uh, uh, this woman in her uh, silversmith shop. She was hand making jewelry and started to learn that trade. Well, very soon uh, we started a business together and very soon gem dealers began to call us. And I like the gems. I've always loved uh, the idea of gems. Yeah. And, but I was very interested to, I wanted to understand quality. I wanted to understand why one tourmaline was better than the other, one sapphire and so forth. So I began asking them questions. Well, the answers I got were either nonsensical or basically meant to confuse rather than elucid, rather than to clarify. Okay. In other words, these guys didn't want to tell me anything. Yeah. Later, I found out it was often the case that they didn't know it, that they didn't know it. They couldn't explain it because they didn't understand it themselves. Yeah. So I said, all right, you know, I, I spent two years studying philosophy at the graduate level. I know how to research. Let me go and find the books. And I'll find the books and I'll read the books and I'll learn. Well, I found the books all right. And the books, there are all sorts of books on the lore and the, and the geology and the crystallography and so forth on gems. But there was absolutely nothing on quality and connoisseurship. Nothing. Okay. So for several hundred years, the trade had kept that a secret. And uh, so I decided I'd, I was going to find out. So I started off, uh, I, I signed up for uh, GIA courses towards the graduate gemology degree. And then in 1985, I made my first trip to Bangkok. Okay. I mean, I was a community organizer before. So what, what you would do as a community organizer, you would go in the community and talk to people. Well, so I wanted to learn about gem. So I went to the community, which was Bangkok. Yeah. You know, the the queen city of gems and to talk to people. And I had, I love traveling. So my, my first trip was Bangkok. My second trip, I went to the Tuamota Islands, uh, to the Pearl Farms. I went to Australia, to, uh, to Queensland, Queensland Outback, to, uh, to uh, Boulder Opal Mine. Then I went to Bangkok and Hong Kong. And from there I went to East Africa, Brazil, Colombia, and you were buying each and time selling? learning. Okay. You and were, uh, you were buying and selling on these trips or this is just, I was buying. Yes, exactly. Okay. It was great. I got, it was winter time. There was nothing doing in the, in the American gem jewelry business. So I went on a, I'd take a tax deductible trip. I'd buy stones and I'd make money. I could see no downside to it. Yeah. So I'd go for a month at a time, sometimes longer. You know, most dealers, they'll go to Bangkok for three days. They're in and out. I go to Bangkok, stay for two weeks. Yeah. And I, you know, if, you, if you're asking questions of a guy, somebody you're handing money to, you're much more likely to answer them <laughs> than if you're just some guy saying, hey, tell me all about how you judge Ruby. Yeah. 
And it is true that, uh, you know, my experience in Bangkok and in any of the, the gym districts in, in around different places that I've been, you know, a lot of the people that are dealing stones and, and buying and selling stones, they're usually not graduate gemologists, but they do have this sort of learned experience and this learned specialty where they do know very well what, you know, whatever is their one thing that they do, whether it's rubies or whether it's emeralds or whatever, yeah. they know that probably because they learned it from the, you know, wh their parents or whoever they learned it from. But a lot of those guys and women are, are, they really are experts in their field, but they might not know, like you said, how to, how to tell that or the way that they learned, maybe it's so long that they wouldn't know how to put it back into one sentence or even one explanation of, you know, how do you grade rubies or, or whatever it is. So how did you end up extracting this information from the communities that you were visiting? Well, I asked a lot of questions, but I looked at a lot of stones. And, you know, in those days, GIA would tell you in the colored stone course and when I went to the lab that although there was an absolute system for grading diamonds, when it came to colored stones, it was all relative. It was all in what you like, you know? And if you'd ask the question to the dealers or to the GIA people, they'd say, do you like it? Buy it. You know, that was the answer. Uh, but it wasn't a very good answer yeah. from my point of view. So I just kept asking questions. And eventually what I discovered after asking a lot of questions and learning a lot, and reading a lot, was that if you took a single gemstone, a fine gemstone, and put it in front of you, light it up perfectly, and put it in front of you, and you sat down and you wrote a paragraph describing everything about that gemstone, inside that paragraph will be all the criteria for judging a gemstone. Okay. Simple, right? Yeah, it's almost but, po it's poetic almost. It's, it's a very simple thing that takes you a long time to get to. It's sort of a Zen thing, you know? Yeah. In martial arts, you repeat actions over and over and over again until they become second nature, till you reach the point where you don't really have to do anything. You just respond. Yeah. But uh, with gemstones, you had to spend a lot of time learning and looking before you came to the point, before you reached the educated point of view. And then you forgot all of that. And as I said, wrote a single paragraph, take the finest ruby and sit down and describe that ruby. Yeah. Well, all the elements of, of quality grading in, in ruby will be in that paragraph. And so in that period of learning, how important was it for you in the actual moment of selling? Because I think for me, one thing that I've always wondered about, because I'm here in Bangkok, I'm at one point in the trade, right? But I'm not at the end point. I'm in sort of in the middle as the cutter or whatever. And I've never had the experience of being a reseller, especially in America or anywhere in the West. You know, everything for me is online. So I've never had that experience of having a shop and selling a stone directly to a customer's face and seeing the visual cues, the psychological experience that's happening. So how important was that for your learning experience and to, to understand quality assessment? Extremely important. Um, I'm a salesman. Okay. In high school, I sold magazines door to door. I sold encyclopedias door to door. I learned how to sell. But in order to sell, you got to have a pitch. You got to understand your product in order to describe your product. Yeah. And that was one of the motivations for me to learn. You know, if I was going to sit down as I did years later with say $3 million rubies in front of me and the client said to me, why do you think this one is better? Well, person who's able to spend a million dollars on a ruby is normally a fairly intelligent person. So if you can't tell him why, or her why yeah it's a good shot you're going to miss that sale yeah but if you can really romance that stone and tell the truth at the same time maybe you got the sale okay 
So there was there was two things happening. There was uh, being in being in the trade communities and understanding the the vocabulary of the buyers, and then taking that stuff back to the states and then understanding the vocabulary of of the uh, of the of the customer, and being able to. Well, speak. if you were if you read the chapters on individual gems and secrets of the gem trade, you're reading. If you were sitting across from me, looking at a tourmaline and you are asking me questions, it's all in that chapter. Basically what I'm explaining to the reader is exactly what I'm explaining to the buyer. There's yeah. no difference. And I know one thing that we were speaking about before the talk, um, you know, in when you go through the formal gemology program, you, you learn, you know, this whole system of identifying stones, but you don't really learn how to see quality because you don't really get a chance to see a lot of high quality stones in, in any school really it doesn't matter which school it's just not possible for a school to have a million dollar ruby you know like, so you yeah, so, send your aquarium gravel to grade yeah so <laughs> i think i think that's one of the highlights of your book but but you know i guess for i'm I, i'm putting my mind into the new graduate right now because that's what i was once upon a time as well and mm -hmm. it's it's hard to even get to the point where someone would show you three million dollar rubies because until you've made some purchases you can't you know your the doors are not open for you even for me now i probably couldn't do that in bangkok because i just don't have that buying power so how you know that's so it, that's true that's that's true that people aren't gonna you know they're, they're not gonna sit down with you if you've got you know a hundred hundred bucks and show you million dollar stones yeah uh, it's a waste of their time. Uh, I did have people do that because I was very interested and I asked questions and I listened respectfully to the answers. And sometimes people like Joe Belmont uh, and, and other dealers, Barry Hodgen, um, uh, the Cody brothers, people like that, would answer my questions yeah. because uh, they saw that I was sincere and really wanted to learn. Yeah. Uh, they were a minority, however. Yeah. So, okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, answer the, the viewers questions as we go along. So um, Mariana M asked, how, Richard, how do you specifically romance the stone? What's your, what's your special technique? Read secrets of the jam trade. It's all there. I mean, I don't have a special technique. The truth, yeah. deep knowledge and the truth. Know your product, know what you're talking about, and you're, and you're fine. Don't try to fake it. And is there- If you try to fake it, you lose. Yeah, and is there, is some part of that knowing how to match the, the needs of your customer and the budget of your customer with a certain stone that you have? You know, for instance, if the guy if if the guy's trying to show me a stone and I only have a hundred bucks, it, like you said, it's a waste of time to show a million dollar stone because it's just not going to happen. So how much how much of that go, comes into play when you're in the retail world? For me, if a person was interested and they wanted to see rubies, I'd show them every one I had. Okay. Uh, because maybe they only had a hundred dollars today, but what about next year? They might have five thousand. Yeah. And they would remember that I took the time to educate them. Yeah. I, I can tell you a story, which is a sh it's fairly short, but it's, it's an interesting one. I had a client, a very rich client, who, uh, who, who did business with me, and she, I, she sold, I sold her uh, a Pod Paracha Sapphire ring. And I was an exceptional Pod Paracha. Uh, and, it was, you know, it was worth a couple of hundred thousand dollars. A little bit, some months later, she had read my book. Some months later, she decided she wanted an orange diamond out of the blue. Okay. She said, I want an orange diamond. So I made a mistake. I called three guys. Should have only called one because the, an or orange diamonds is so bloody rare. That if you call three guys, pretty soon the calls ricochet from one guy to the other. Yeah. So that, and by the time they finish ricocheting, the price goes up. But what she did in the meantime is she found out that Harry Winston in New York had the pumpkin diamond, which is a 4.25 fancy vivid orange 
considered to be the finest pure orange diamond in the world at that time. I'm not sure that's true today. So she went down to New York and she went to Harry Winston and she, you know, she can't, went to the shop and she wanted to talk about colored diamonds. So this sales lady waited on her and told her all of this stuff, gave her all this information. She went back to her to hotel and she picked up my book. Now I didn't have a chapter on orange diamonds, but I did have one on yellows and most of what she saw were yellows. So she read the chapter again. She called me on the phone. She said, Richard, I just came from Harry Winston and this sales lady told me X, Y, and Z, but I see in your book that those things that she told me aren't true. I said, <laughs> well, you're right. Next day, she goes back to Harry Winston. Now, somehow, maybe they figured out that she was somebody that Winston should talk to. So Ron Winston came down. And the first thing he did is he looked at her Padbaracha ring. And he said, oh, that's a pretty ring. May I clean it for you? Now, clean an offer from a jeweler to clean a ring usually means that he wants to examine it, look at it. So he went and he cleaned it. And he came back and he brought it back. And he said, you know, this is a really beautiful stone. He said, we just can't find stones of this quality anymore. Now, that was the end of Harry Winston. He was finished. My client figured, well, if first of all, my little jeweler in Lenox, Massachusetts, knows more about colored diamonds than Harry Winston does, and he can't get Podparacha sapphires of that quality, then why don't I deal with my little jeweler in Lenox, Massachusetts? So she came back. And we did a $2 million sale a month later. Wow. So this, but th this is a great customer. I mean, this is the dream customer, somebody who is informed and is willing to become more informed and, yes. and, and someone who comes back, of course. Um, yeah, that's a great story. Okay. On one of my trips, I, 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 sent, I, I had her on video and I showed her stones right in the source in Vietnam. Mm. <laughs> so that, that's she I'm loved sure, that yeah I'm, loved I'm, I think for anybody who's who's not used to going to those kind of places it's a real treat to be able to have that kind of personal yeah. experience where you're sort of directly involved and, and get to see a little bit behind the scenes um, okay one question just came in from Irma Willie she said um, assuming that you can't get the perfect stone you know how do you prioritize between cut color and size let's just say when you're when you're buying i guess you know, i don't prioritize it's got to have color it's got to be clean and it's got to be well cut or i don't buy it okay so every single stone for you that's an indiv that you have to assess it individually and say okay is this worth whatever you know is this worth the attention of my customer base essentially exactly if it isn't fine <clears throat> i'm not going to buy it yeah. If I can't afford a five carat, I'll buy a two carat. Okay. But now there are times, of course, when, you know, we have limited amounts of money. I've always been poor from that point of view. I never had a large amount of capital. I think the total, my total personal investment in my business was $129. <laughs> so any money, <laughs> any, any capital I had was generated by the business, but I never had a lot. Okay. I, I did have a, a very good reputation for paying my bills so I could get almost anything I wanted. Okay. But um, I didn't compromise on quality. I mean, a beautiful stone sells itself. Yeah. Doesn't it? Oh, it's true. And I mean, I think for anyone who's been to Bangkok and, and you've, or, or any, any big trading hub and you see the amount of stones or even in Tucson, really, I mean, when you see yeah. the amount of stones that are available to the, to the market, yeah, I mean, it's overwhelming, but most of those stones are not top quality. Uh, yeah. Most of them, right. almost none of them. Um, right. And most jewelry stores, what you see in most jewelry stores is, is low end crap. Yeah. So, and you know, I, I don't know how you can sell low end crap myself. I mean, who wants to buy a black sapphire? Yeah, I mean, there, I, I like blue ones myself. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, there seems to be a market for everything, but I guess you just it have does. to know those, know that customer base. Well, you okay, make so, a decision. What, yeah. what, what business are you in? Yeah. I was, I was in the business of selling beautiful gems. So yeah. I only bought beautiful gems.
Now that doesn't mean everything I bought. I mean, I bought a lot of stuff that nobody wanted. Yeah. I bought spinels in the nineties. Uh, I bought, uh, I don't know. I, I, I bought some of the first, uh, some of the first Pariba tourmaline. I was in Brazil at the time that came down and, and, you know, people were looking at it and scratching their heads because, you know, tourmaline wasn't supposed to look like that. <laughs> and, and, you know, I bought two parcels, one for 350 a carat, one for 400 a carat. I think the last stone I had, I sold for 5,000 a carat. Because well, the right place at the it right was time. a, I was, I was there. Uh, I was in, I was in East Africa at the right time too. I was in Brazil at the right time. Um, I made, you know, um, but a beautiful stone is a beautiful stone, even if nobody else knows about it. Yeah. And if you, and if you know it's beautiful and you feel it's beautiful and you understand it, you can sell it. You can sell it. One thing I was wondering, you know, cause we're still, we're still talking about you building up this knowledge base to be able to write that book. How many mistakes did you have to make along the way as part of your learning experience? uh not many okay i i tried my best to deal with uh very reputable people um i have a good nose you know uh ernest hemingway said that uh if you're going to be a writer you've got to have a um a great uh a bull nose for bullshit and uh after 10 years of organizing and dealing with politicians and uh, other nefarious types, I developed <laughs> a pretty good nose. And I really didn't make any major errors. Okay. Luckily, see, I didn't have enough money to make major errors. <laughs> if I had started off with a million dollars the first time I went to Bangkok, I'm sure I would have made plenty of them. Yeah. But I went, my first trip, I had $10,000. Okay. Or I think, no, I think, was it, maybe it was just 5000 Okay. Uh, and so I had to be very, very careful. But I did deal with, with reputable people. And I, you know, if something's too good to be true, it probably is. Yeah. Too good to be true. Yeah. So um, I never fell victim uh, to, to that. And, you know, there's a lot of that in the gem trade. You know, they'll, they'll sell you something, a beryllium diffused Padmaracha sapphire. Wow, it's only 200 carat. Well, how is that possible? This is a rare stone. How in the world could they be worth 200, uh, sold for 200 carat? Well, as it turned out, there were beryllium, um, there were beryllium uh, sapphires. So the people who spent the $200 a carat, they got took. Yeah. Um, so I guess what I wanted to say next was, uh, you know, obviously, and we're going to talk more about some of these adventures and we got some photos and stuff to look at, but what, what I wanted to get to was, you know, obviously you chose to do something different than everybody else. You, you spent the yeah. time to, to accrue this knowledge, but instead of keeping it a secret, like all of, you know, all the, the other people that you were trying to talk to, you kind of put that information out into the public and, and you know you put it into your book and you didn't keep it as a as your you know your secret knowledge like every other gem dealer does How, why did you decide to do that well what i guess i was i you? was frust i was frustrated by the difficulty of obtaining the knowledge i remember i was sitting on a on a dock on monahi monahi island in the tuamoto archipelago in 19 i think 86 and I started writing an article on black pearls. You know, at that point, the only, uh, you know, it was only one article in English on black pearls and it had been in, appeared in National Geographic. So I decided I would write a, a trade article uh, on black pearls. And I thought, I remember thinking to myself, I think it was my 40th birthday. I remember thinking to myself, you know, I could write an article, I could do the research on these and write an article and I could, go to a Bangkok and I could do the research and write another article. And eventually I'd have enough articles written that I could put them into a book. And if I published the book, maybe I could become famous. And if I became famous, 
then a lot of people would want to buy gems from me and I'd become rich. This sounds like a good plan. That was my plan. And it sort of worked, right? And it worked. Yeah. It so, worked. Yeah. And as we can see, we have the book now. It, it, it exists. And as you said, it, it became a, a big seller, right? Oh, yeah. It's a... Uh, it's sold, it's sold right. It's been selling uh, very well for nine, is it 20 years now. First edition and now the second edition. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're into like 40 some thousand copies. Eat your heart out, uh, Dick Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so another question from the audience. Um, do you think that w that uh, the trade will ever get to the point where colored gems, you know, as, as we said in the beginning, there's a sort of a science to evaluating diamonds that doesn't exist for the colored stone world. Do you think that the world of colored stones will, will basically get boiled down to a set of circum or a, curr a curriculum criteria number base that you could actually just say, okay, here's, here's every sapphire, here's every ruby quality cut, clarity, you know, just the way that they do with diamonds? No, I don't think so exactly. I mean, today there's a, there's a, a gem evaluation system under every bush, right? Yeah. You've got one, the guide published one, uh, Jamie Wizard is another, and I, I, I haven't kept track of them all, but I think there are a, few, a couple of more of them. And they, and they try to boil, uh, evaluation down but it's difficult because first of all the systems are based either on uh, paint chips color opaque color chips mm -hmm. or in some cases uh, they're they're basically cartoons yeah. now, I'm not saying that they're not useful because they are useful but they're only useful to people who know what they're looking at yeah and color is is far more sophisticated and complicated than colorlessness yeah exactly right i mean a diamond first of all the, the system that's developed for diamonds was developed by a public relations firm and it was meant to boil down quality in easily digestible pieces so that a diamond dealer could explain it to a customer and sell his diamond. Now, and they did, they did a my, great job with that. I mean, it really works. People totally understand the yeah. diamond system. Even consumers can understand that. But yes, yes, and and limited though. Uh, there was at the time the old dealers said, "Well, you know, if you do that, you're going to you're going to take uh, diamonds and turn them in a, into a commodity." Well, the fact is they were a commodity at the time. You know, there's 150 million carats, cut carats of diamonds uh, distributed in the world each and every year. Mm -hmm. Diamonds, colorless diamonds under five carats are not rare, yeah. not particularly rare at all. So diamonds were a commodity and uh, the diamond grading system was a way to uh, grade elements of that commodity and and it worked out pretty well except when you bring in type 2a Golconda diamonds and I have a chapter in my book where I where I describe Golconda stones or type 2a stones and what makes them superior to uh, to regular diamonds of the same grade mm -hmm. like a D flawless uh, uh, diamond uh, that against a D flawless uh, type 2A. What characteristics make the type 2A superior? Now, this is something that was known in the trade 150 years ago, but ignored up until about 20 years ago. Um, and these criteria, the criteria that separates these two types of colorless diamonds, are real. And if you understand it, as in, in this case, I was able to sell a type 2A a diamond, another million dollar sale, uh, simply because I could describe to the client why this stone was so much better 
even though the, the nuances of quality are subtle. But this diamond was so much better than a type B. And I know one thing that we don't hear so much, well, one thing that we don't hear about at all in, in the gemology schools, but I know that people do still talk about in, in terms of fine diamonds. And uh, especially one thing that I know that you spoke a lot about it, through the French blue is the water of the stone. Yeah. And, and this is something that I, I didn't hear for a few years, my first few years, but the sort of deeper I get into the trade, the more I hear people, even not, not just for diamonds, but for, for rubies and sapphires as well, speaking about the crystal or, or the water. And, uh, you know, talking about that sort of fluid appearance or, or whatever, you know, I mean, how would you speak about water? How do you define? Well, it, water is a very old term. Tavernier uses it. And what it is, is a combination of two things, color and transparency. Now, in, in modern grading systems and in G, at GIA, you would never have them talking about transparency as a quality criteria. But in the old days, everybody understood that, that, qual, that, 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 that um, transparency, diaphanity, if you will, uh, was a criteria uh in the grading of, of gemstones in the grading of diamonds in the grading of pearls and mm -hmm. in the gradings uh, grading of of other gemstones and that was referred to as water now other people use the term water as uh, talk about color and color combination of color and clarity but that's because nobody spoke to one another so the people who wrote back in the 17th and 18th century um often did not have, like me, they didn't have, uh, they weren't able to source, uh, source books or people who would explain to them their, their error. <clears throat> so that's what water refers to. And clarity and crystal, and I use crystal and I make it my fourth C of quality evaluation. I use it um, because it begins with C, so that you get color, cut clarity in crystal and but crystal or transparency is a very important criterion grading i mean take two star sapphires uh they're both blue they both have very good stars perfect stars well which is going to be the most valuable the, the, the opaque stone or the translucent stone yeah yeah, it's. A, I mean, it, it's a. It's a totally valid point. It's something that we, or sort of has been phased out a little bit, but still has some resonance or or, or relevance, I guess. In well, it's of, important, you know. People, if but if the mind doesn't see it, the eye doesn't either. Yeah, and if you've never so seen, so if you it, don't understand the criteria, then you can't articulate it, and you really can't see it. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I was going to say. Right if you here. haven't, if you haven't seen those kind of quality of stones, then you won't even know that that even exists because you've only seen, uh, you know, maybe a lower or medium quality. Uh, so let's right. let's go back to your store because that 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 brought up a lot of questions for people uh, in terms of um, talking to customers and, and running the store. Um, Nikki Novella asked. Um, well, just generally, what, what was the demographic of the community that was, that was coming into your store? Well, <laughs> I'm telling you, the first, uh, my first store was, uh, it was in a place called Payden Aram in South Dartmouth, Massachusetts. If you go there now, it's a hot dog stand. Gives you an idea of where I started. Uh, uh, the second store, uh, the second gallery was in Lenox, Massachusetts. And I told, chose Lenox uh, Mass for two reasons. One, it was as far as I could afford to get with the money I had. And uh, the largest U-Haul available at that time stuffed with all, everything I owned. And two, demographically, it was a highly educated, um, rich, uh, air, wealthy area. And it was a New York market, not a Boston market. In other words, okay. it wasn't a New England market, it was a New York market. And that okay. was important because 
we had been in what you might call the Boston market. And the Boston market is very conservative. People would come into the shop and what they would want is you to reproduce something like their grandmother's circle pin. Now, if you're a, if you're a creative craftsman, that gets old pretty quickly. But in Lenox, most of the people who came in the summer, and the season was only six weeks, so it's, it's also the place where the Boston Symphony Orchestra comes in the summer. Okay. Uh, the place they come to is called Tanglewood. So it's a very highly educated uh, and sophisticated crowd as well. Um, and, that's, and that's why we were there. That's why we went and set up, uh, set up shop there. Okay. And so do you think that being in a certain location, I mean, you, you just mentioned the difference between the, the New York and the Boston market, but do you think being in a certain location in a certain city is, is making a big difference? And if you're able to do the selling or, or if you're not really doing much business at all? Well, what are the first three or five laws of retail, depending on um, who you ask? Location, 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 right? Okay. You, you can't deny that. If you're going to have a bricks and mortar store and you're selling high-end diamonds, then you better be in, in a neighborhood or you, but there ought to be cars going by your store or your shop or your gallery, whatever it is. The people driving those cars better have the money to sufficient to pay for your product. Otherwise yeah. you're in the wrong location. Yeah, exactly. It's simple as that. And so along the same line, do you think um, in terms of actually making the sale or, or presenting items to your potential customers, you know, do, do you need to um, sort of make a prejudgment about the customer about whether they're able to buy or not or what they want to buy? Or do you just try and put all of your, you know, your, uh, your pitch into just into the stones? Well, you know, I'm an educator by and a salesman. Yeah. So if you ask me a question, if you want to see a stone, I'm going to show it to you. How in the world can I tell whether or not you've got enough money to buy it? I mean, in some cases, if you come, <laughs> came in the shop with four days of beard and a bottle of Muscatel in your front pocket and you're staggering, the chances are I'm wasting my time. Yeah. But uh, a lot of people with a lot of money don't necessarily dress that. Does that answer the question? I think so. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's really about just the stones. And so uh, one question that I had missed from a few minutes ago, uh, Mubashir Mansour had asked, um, you know, you, you said romancing the stone. Do you think that's a, not just for you, but do you think that's a big part of the industry in general? Like in terms of the, as, as a seller, do you, is it important that you have to romance the stone or does the stone romance itself, for, for example? Well, if you're a salesman, that's what you do. Yeah. And if you're selling to the end user, if you're selling to the, to the person who's going to have you set it in a ring to put on her finger, then yeah. I mean, that's part of what you do. I mean, if there's no romance, I wouldn't have been in the gem business at all. I mean, yeah. You know, I can't, I can't see working for a, a commercial a jewelry store. I'd be bored out of my skull. I would have gotten out of the business years ago. Yeah. And, and I guess really any, any product could be seen in that way. I mean, when we see the way that Apple markets iPods, they romance the iPod. They show you every cool way that you can be with that iPod and make you feel like you're going to be that cool or the iPhone, I guess. But you know, so any product really is going to get romanced in some way or another. Though in jewelry, I think we tend to actually pair, uh, make it aligned with actual romance, you know, love and met weddings and stuff like that. Whereas, well, yeah, that's one aspect, but uh, this large, this one, one, I've had about half a dozen major clients over the course of my career. And this one client that I talked to you about who went to Harry Winston, she was just very interested. I mean, she really, you know, she, we would sit for a couple of hours talking about stones, you know, yeah. regularly, sometimes uh, twice a month. And we, I'd be in the office with her for two, two and a half hours, showing her slides. I had a slide projector, <laughs> uh, showing her stones, you know, 
and she'd spend two million dollars a year with me. Well, that's Certainly right. worth the trouble, but yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. Yeah, I, I mean, mean, I love gems. It you sounds. Know, if you're like not, it. if you don't love gems, you shouldn't be in the business. It's yeah. as simple as that. If yeah. you don't love them, get the hell out. Yeah. Do something you love, because you know you only live once. It's true. So it's you might advice. as well enjoy yourself. It's good advice. So you mentioned before that you were you were set up as a gallery. Would you say that the way you had it set up is that different than a traditional jewelry store or? What yeah, we just did handmade originals. Okay. Uh, almost everything, not everything that we had on, on display were things that we made. We, we carried some of the, uh, some of uh, what I consider the most creative artist craftsmen uh, in the United States and uh, in Europe, from Europe. Uh, but we made a lot of what we sold and we did everything. Uh, I mean, I was a purist. If you had gone into a jewelry shop in the 18th century or gone into my jewelry store, there was very little difference. Mm. Uh, we, we'd use flexible shafts, you know, flex shafts, which people didn't have. And eventually uh, I bought a laser welder because they made a lot of sense. But generally the techniques we use uh, were techniques that went back to the Egyptians. Yeah. I know um, maybe about a month ago on the show we had um... – we had a jeweler on here who specializes in hand hand fabrication, hand engraving, and I actually I actually put put up some photos of his jewelry studio with some medieval and, and Renaissance ones, and he was kind of mm -hmm. going through comparing, and basically his setup was exactly the same as what they were using, other than he had a couple of electric things like what you're saying, the flexi shaft and everything. Yeah. But the jewelry station really, especially compared to the gem cutters tools which have evolved quite a bit since the Renaissance, uh, the jewelry tools are really not so different. I mean, unless you're gonna get into casting and stuff, but the actual fabricating of precious metals is, is a, really it's an ancient technique that hasn't really oh, been improved yeah. on too much. You mean, you mean that gem cutting has improved since, uh, since the buffalo horn fittings that they use up in Burma? Yeah, I mean, those, are, I those ones haven't improved. They're still using those, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I've got one of them. Yeah, I do too. But, uh, you know, <laughs> for the great. most part, for the most part, yeah. Yeah, especially, you know, compared to Tavernier's time, um, a lot has changed. You know, we understand crystallography. We understand, you know, the refractive index and all these things that they they had an idea about but didn't have an explanation. They hadn't discovered. They didn't, right. Yeah, but I mean. Well, one I, of the things when I started in the business is uh, you'd go to Bangkok and you'd see a lot of flat stones, a lot of windowed stones. And w what the trade believed in the United States is that people in Bangkok didn't know how to cut. And that's why the stones looked that way. Well, I mean, what an absurd idea. Here people have been, have been cutting for, what, five, 10,000 years, 5,000 years at least, and they didn't know how to cut? Yeah. Well, they cut for weight. That was the reason those stones were that way. And I mean, I've seen people cut perfect stones on jam peg uh, machines in, in Mogok and yeah. in, in Bangkok. Uh, no, they true. know how to cut. I mean, but the American trade would take, you know, they tell their clients, well, you know, they, they look this way because, uh, you know, in Asia, they don't know how to do it. Yeah. No, I mean, pe people still say that in the cutting communities that I'm in, you know, in the forums and stuff. And actually, uh, I try to I try to fight that as much as possible, because now that I've been here for so long and I've worked with so many factories, I mean, it is true. Sometimes it is true. There are some bad cutters. There are some countries that oh, are sure. than others. But in Thailand, you know, if when you see windowed stones, it's usually because they've asked the cutters to cut them that way on purpose. Yep. It's not yep. whether it's to save weight or you know, a lot of the factories that I talk to that, that, that aren't just cutting calibrated stones, but they're cutting for the client, they say, actually, the cut, almost always, the jewelers are asking for flat stones because they want low profile settings. And they actually have to explain to the jewelers, and I'm talking about big jewelers in France and around Europe, uh, they're actually explaining to the jewelers over and over again, you know, if you don't have enough depth, you're going to make a windowed stone, it's going to look dull. And sometimes the the specifications from the jewelers are so flat that they make them sign a waiver saying, you know, we're telling you that this is going to look bad. And if you still want it, you're going to have to sign a waiver. Yeah. We're not taking the stones back. And that really surprised me. I didn't, I, you know, you don't hear, hear that too much, but that's actually, you know, half the time what is going on. Well, and then in the, the 80s, what, 
when in the eighties, when I started, I would pick for cut. You know, I would, I would look at a parcel of one carat sapphires and I would pick for color and cut. And you know, uh, the average parcel has eyes and dogs in it, right? <laughs> the eyes are the few really nice stones they put in there to make the rest of the parcel look good. Yeah. But if you could buy the eyes, which is what I did, because I'd refuse to buy anything else. And I'd sit and, you know, I'd sit, I'd sit in there, I'd sit for seven to 10 days and I'd get eventually what I wanted. Um, if you pick for cut, you've got a big, uh, you've got a big leg up it's because the prettiest stones are the easiest ones to sell. Yeah. But basically the American jeweler might want 10,000 seven by five blue sapphires. Well, how do you, how do you deliver 10,000 unless you go right to the bottom of yeah. the quality uh, pyramid? No. It's the only way to do it. There's no so that's stones. why yeah. Zales and K's and all these other jewelers, you know, they, they, they tell a client sapphires are black. I had clients come in and they look at a beautifully cut, really fine blue sapphire and they say, but that's not a good sapphire because my jeweler told me that sapphires have to be darker than that. And I said, you mean like a faceted onyx? And they say, yeah. And they wouldn't believe that this was a better stone, although they'd say, do you know this? Thing? I really, it's pretty. <laughs> no, it's too bad. It's not a good one. <laughs> Can't believe their own eyes. But the fact of the matter is the stone will, to a degree, sell itself. Yeah. And if you, could, if you have a client, and I used to do this, I'd have my stones in little velvet boxes, and I'd have all my one carat sapphires. The client would come in and look, and, I'd say, and they'd say, well, what's the best stone? And I'd say, which one do you like the best? And invariably, they pick the best stone without even thinking about it. It's just the prettiest pebble in the stream. Yeah. It's as simple as that. Yeah. And any moron can tell if they don't get a lot of education in their minds confusing yeah. them. If they yeah. just forget it and just pick what they like, they'll invariably pick the best. Yeah. Interesting. So, isn't it? so uh, a few particular questions just came up. Um, did you, Were you normally buying cut or did you ever buy rough stones as well yes i have bought rough very carefully yeah uh usually i, I usually i i get another dealer to, to tell me if you know a cutter say uh, yeah that's that's a good idea yeah. but if i so, looked at the stone really really carefully i had a loomy loop i used okay i look at the, at the rough really really carefully i couldn't find anything wrong with it and it looked like it you know it would assume a good shape, I would buy it. Uh, I don't think I lost, I mean, you know, you can, your profit margin goes up dramatically if you pick rough. Yeah, but your, your I chance say that I was, mistake. I wasn't an expert too. at all in picking rough, so I was very careful. Yeah. Uh, but I did, like in, we sat in Brazil and those are the salad days in the, uh, in the mid to late eighties and, and these, these dealers would come in or these, these young kids would come in with tourmaline crystals as big as your index finger, right? Perfectly clean. And, you know, you can buy them for $15 a gram. Not anymore, guys. Yeah. Uh, and cut. Uh, I remember I had this one uh, dealer who was an American that I served as my broker, and he cut beautiful opposed bars. You familiar with that cut? Yeah, yeah. So I'd have him take a crystal this long, and cut it into an opposed bar. Beautiful stone. Now, it wouldn't be of any value at all, or use at all, the commercial jeweler wouldn't know what to do with it. No, it's too weird. Boy, if you set it in a pin, you know, the thing looked like a digital readout on your... Well, it's actually, just let, amazing. Let me pop up, because I have all these photos sitting here that you sent me. Let me just pop one up right now. We can, we can sh you know, show that exact thing, because you sent me one from Spirison this one so that's yeah not, that one's not exactly the opposed bar but i think this is the this is the grandfather of the opposed bar yes it is and um i actually it cut is. one of these today so i think it's funny that we're talking about this but uh this is what he was do this is a uh, uh, francis spears and he was a cutter in the 20s to the i think the 70s and this was his big contribution to american cutting which was the opposed bar so he's got all these long facets going this way on the top and then on the bottom perpendicular facets which yeah i have one of spears and stones and it is an opposed bar 
the difference is that he was working with Margaret Tapata, who is uh, the doyen of American art jewelers. He, she's the most famous uh, art jeweler mm -hmm. uh, of the 20th century. And she, the stone was cut windowed on purpose because yeah. the objective was to show the background in a dynamic way so that uh, that Y-shaped uh, metal background would move as the pendant moved on the, on the buyer's neck. And so- and, and that was the objective to do that. For the one that you so have, is it quartz like this? Uh, I'm trying to remember, I haven't seen it. I think it might be citrine. Is the back flat or does it actually have facets? Yeah, it's facet. It's an opposed bar. But it's a t but it's intentionally windowed though, because that's because I yeah, knew, oh yeah intent. I knew when I saw this yeah. one it was intentionally windowed, but I didn't know if he actually just made the back flat. Um, okay, so yeah, I just, no, it's elliptical. Okay, I just wanted to pop that one up while we were talking about that, so people could visualize what we were speaking about. Yeah, and we've sort of gone off the track of of you know traditional cutting into this very specialized. Uh, Spearson was was the first, you might say, um, or the grandfather of the fantasy cutters, Munsteiner, Wynn, uh, Glenn Lehrer. Yeah. Uh, he, he, was, he predated them by, uh, by a number of years, but he was, uh, you might say, the first or the grandfather of the movement. It's true. He, to me, he's, a, he's such an interesting character because he's... Uh... He's still in the pretty early days. I mean, in, in the 20s, he's, he's right in the first wave of, of American faceting. And then by the 50s, he's, um, you know, he's still like a pioneer. And he, but he really is doing things that no one had done at that point. And even still today, I mean, he's very, still very, even though I don't think anyone really knows his name, but we know that cut, at least cutters in America know that cut. And yeah, um, yeah it, it's cool. Um, okay, still speaking about your shop because people are so interested in this. Did you um, did you take consignment from? Um, I mean, did you take on consignment work, or did you only have your own inventory and and, and stuff for sale? If I liked what the jeweler was doing, and I looked for very artful pieces, so I did a lot of shopping uh, with the American Craft Council. Um, I would, I would, I would do two things. I would buy some pieces and then I would ask for a consignment. Um, uh, and usually I wanted it to come in around June so that I'd have it available for the, uh, July, August high season. And, um, uh, so if I liked the jeweler, I'd get as much consignment as I could, you know, because, yeah. uh, if it works. Yeah, because, and also budget for budgetary reasons. Yeah. Often I'd buy uh, the, the lower end pieces and I'd get the jeweler to send me a couple of the higher ends so that I could put them together and then show the client, you know, what this particular artist was doing. And these were jewelry artists and they, were, that, they interested me. Just as fine gemstones interested me. I wasn't interested in commercial jewelry. I was interested in art jewelry. Mm, okay. And you know, there was a crafts movement which started in the 1960s and a lot of young craftsmen, mostly self-taught, started producing beautiful pieces of jewelry just as a number of young cutters uh, started to, to, to cut gemstones. Yeah. And uh, it was part of the same movement. Yeah, that's so cool. So I call it the second arts and crafts movement. It happened just about a hundred years after the first arts and crafts movement, which began in about 1860. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. So somebody asked a question that I already wanted to ask. So you said you kind of came into the trade around, I think you said 85 or 86. Uh, the winter of 78 is when we started the business. Okay. So between this, between 78 and now, what's changed? Obviously a lot, but, but from your point of view, what's, what's the biggest things that have changed since that point? Uh, from a jeweler, jeweler's point of view yeah, or yeah. from a gem dealer? Oh, um, 
both or either, or even just as a retailer? Well, for me as a, I had a, I had two leg, I had a, a double leg up basically. I mean, I, I figured if I was going to be successful, I had to do things that the other guy wasn't doing. Mm -hmm. So we had a, you know, we had a traditional goldsmith shop and we sold fine colored stones. I didn't bother with colored diamonds, really, unless somebody wanted them. I had Melly. I found that they were good, you know, to sprinkle a few, a few beautiful diamonds in with a nice colored stone. But I began with a colored gem. The biggest change, I think, in the gem trade, you know, when I started off writing and going to these places, they were really remote. And nobody ever, nobody went to them. I was one of the, I think I was the first to really start writing articles that, that appeared, my first two articles appeared in Jewelers Quarterly magazine about, and I think the first one was on Africa, East Africa, about the gems of East Africa. Yeah. But nobody, you know, I mean, American jewelers never went anywhere but to the New York show. And that was it. Mm -hmm. So, um, but now things have changed. The world has gotten smaller. And you can be in Tanzania in a little mud hut looking at a parcel of uh, zoocyte. And while, you, while you're nego negotiating a price, the guy's got his iPhone and he's on your website in the United States looking at what you're charging for. Yeah. <laughs> now that, that can be a problem. Yeah. Uh, but it's, you know, so the, the markup has changed in that respect. If you're going from, you know, my objective was to get both the wholesale and retail markups. I mean, right. Mm -hmm. That's why I went around. I made a lot of enemies going around the dealers and becoming a dealer who also sold retail, in other words, vertically integrated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, profit, the profit margins were quite strong. I'd say they're probably reduced by, I don't know, 35% since then. And since I retired in 2016, uh, basically, 2012, but I was writing through 2016 and traveling. Um, I could be wrong about that percentage. It may be even greater. Yeah. And now, if you are a a custom hand handcraft jeweler, the big thing that's changed is laser welders and CAD CAM. Yeah. So now, you don't really need to have um, a skilled goldsmith with you know ten, fifteen years experience who can hand make something right from the beginning from the from the work right from an ingot if necessary. Uh, now you can, uh, you can have it, do it by CAD CAM. Now, the result is not the same. Uh, true hand, hand work is the finest work. Uh, but if all the client wants is you to make him the star of Bethlehem with a, a frog sitting on it, uh, bang, you can do that right on the computer, send it off and have it cast. Yeah. Um, and you couldn't do that. So I, I had the advantage because people would go to a jeweler and say, oh, can you make this? And they couldn't. Or, you know, I could buy non-calibrated stones or really wonky looking stones or fantasy cut stones. And I could set them, whereas most commercial jewelers couldn't. Yeah. So I mm -hmm. was, I basically had a market all to myself. When, when you had the shop and you had jewelers, how many jewelers did you have working in the shop, bench jewelers? Never more than two. Okay. I was very low volume. I mean, you know, the I was a resort retailer. I mean, some of the big dealers, one of the big dealers once said to me, and said, who the hell are you? You know, you're in, you live in Podunk, Massachusetts, and you got a little tiny jewelry store. I mean, what are you doing up here giving lectures at AGTA? Yeah. <laughs> they weren't happy with me. But, um, you know, that's the and, situation. And so from a, from a writing perspective, of course, at that time when you started to write, there must have been, well, not very many books to be resourcing from because you had to, you had to go in, around and do all that legwork. So how different is things now, you know, when you're trying to research a book or work on a book 
or or an article or whatever how different is it now that we have the internet right. and this and that there's still nothing that supersedes secrets of the gem trade if you want to understand quality and connoisseurship yeah so uh and most uh most writers really don't take that subject on um so but if you read secrets you'll see there's over 330 footnotes and I think the bibliography goes on for five pages. So, so it isn't like I made all this stuff out of the, up on the whole cloth. There was information that I was able to glean, particularly as, uh, as, as, as the years went on. There was, there was stuff I was able to glean. And I did find a few books like Al Tatachi, Al Biruni, um, uh, books like that, that did, that did have some in for Jeffries, that did have some information uh, in them, Tavernier. Mm -hmm. So you'll see uh, uh, there's multiple footnotes throughout the text that will lead the reader, um, provide enough information uh, for them to do uh, uh, their own research or to uh, uh, yeah. delve deeper into the subject. Yeah. And so as we're speaking about the changes o over the years, uh, somebody had asked a pretty um, relevant question, which was what, how do you feel about the new um, trend that is basically like responsible sourcing and, and ethical sourcing? I mean, I think maybe you might've retired before this really came in powerfully in terms of a trade influence, but like as a person that's traveled around and seen mines and seen markets, what do you think about the new sort of consumer demand for transparency in, in the way that the, the stones are moving around. I think it's wonderful. I mean, what, what gem mining does is tears up the uh, countryside. Now, because colored stones occur in relatively small deposits, the tearing up is pretty limited. I mean, if you look at the results of diamond mining, it's astonishing. Uh, but, you know, uh, when when you tear up, you ought to be, you ought to have to restore. I mean, if you if you're digging up the ground and you're pulling out stones and you're making a lot of money, some of that some of that that money should be directed in restoring that area back to the way it was prior to your uh, inundations, so to speak. Yeah. So I think I think that's uh, that's very good. And speaking about, the, you know, speaking about the internet and you were saying, you know, you could be in Tanzania and, and they could, you know, you can be talking to your customer, but they can also be looking at your website. Um, yep. Do you think that the internet is, and the trades relationship with the internet is to the point yet where you can have that sort of VIP client that you were speaking about before? Can you do that online now or does it still have to be an in-person experience? Uh, I sold, you know, I, I've had seven different websites. I got into the websites very early. Uh, I had websites uh, with, um, uh, with video on them. I had a whole, I created a grading system. Uh, if the stone had a certificate, that certificate was viewable. Mm -hmm. And I did over the years sell a number of five figure stones four and five figure stones that way uh, of course the internet now is crowded with uh, and, and the problem is one problem is that as i say in the book a picture can tell a thousand lies <laughs> i mean a lot of the a lot of the images that you see at sotheby's and christie's of some of these big stones that are sold have been all tarted up yeah yeah you can use photoshop and you can make a and amethyst look like a ruby. Yeah. Um, so what happens if I I always say to buyers, you know, it's very dangerous to buy online because what are you doing? You're comparing one picture to another. So what you might be buying is the best picture. Yeah. You've got to see the stone, uh, and you've got to be able to return it. Yeah. If you don't, if you don't like it, because with Photoshop and modern lighting, you can. Uh, you can eliminate many sins. It's true. So it's problematic. 
one thing that we've spoken about to different people over the last couple of months um can i hit q, q, q and a here and see what people are asking is that yeah yeah sure i'm basically uh presenting them to you from them oh, okay. but uh yeah go for it well, just fun to see it you can see me okay right yeah yeah yes. um I, I i lost my train but anyway um right. oh, yeah i know what i was gonna say uh you know, through your experience, because we're sort of starting to go speak a little bit about trust and, and you know, whether we're um, buying online or, or you're buying from the gym market in Tanzania or wherever you're at, um, do you think that there's been a change in the trade as, as, as far as trust goes? Are we more or less trustworthy than we used to be uh, when you first came into the trade? I mean, I'm talking about inside the trade, not to not on the consumer level, but just between brokers and dealers and cutters and miners. I understand. I don't know, to tell you the truth. You know, the gem trade has, since its beginning, operated to a large degree on trust. Uh, in order to see the good stones, even, you had to be able to establish your bona fides. Uh, you could call a dealer and say, you know, you want a million dollar sapphire. But if that dealer has never heard of you and you can't provide references, then the chances are he's just going to tell you he doesn't have it. Mm. Um, my approach was very simple. If I was supposed to pay you in 10 days, I paid you in 10 days. If I was supposed to pay in 48 hours, I paid you in 48 hours. That is essential. If you're going to operate in the trade and you're going to move up, or even if you're not going to move up, if you don't, if you're not trusted, if you haven't got the reputation, you're not really able to operate effectively. Um, particularly in the higher echelons of gem, gemstones. I mean, you've heard of burning the stone, right? Yeah. Uh, people, uh, dealers, particularly New York dealers and London dealers, um, will often have an exceptional stone. And if you're in the market for it, if you've got the credibility, they might show you that stone. But the first thing they're going to say to you is, look, Richard, I'm going to show you this ruby, but it's, I, but you can't tell anybody about it. It's very important. I'm willing to show it to you, but you have to promise me that you're not going to tell anybody else about it. Now you think to yourself, well, how the hell are you going to sell anything if nobody knows about it? <laughs> but in the old days, and even today, that was called burning the stone. Yeah. Now, the auction houses do the exact opposite. They take a fine stone. They tell everybody about it. Yeah. But a lot of the trade does not operate that way. There's still a great, still a trade that operates sub rosa that's beneath the auction market where very fine stones will move from one dealer to another and often on a signature. I mean, I could go to New York and bring a million, put a million dollars worth of gems in my pocket on my signature. Yeah, not many people can could do that can do that even today. I mean, there are people, certainly a lot of people who can, yeah. but you have to be trusted in yeah. order to do it. And you know, you can't take a million to say, well, you know, Joe Joe comes in and says, well, I want a five carat top Jim Burmese ruby, and I'm willing to pay a million, ten million, whatever they're willing to pay for it. Well, that's very fine. Well, you don't know if he, this person is is serious. They sound serious. So you go out and you find the stone. I mean, if you've known the person, they're serious and they don't lie to you, you go and find the stone, but you're not going to buy it on the off chance you could sell it. Yeah. You'll go bankrupt doing stuff like that. Yeah. So you've got to get the stone on memo. Well, how do you get a million dollar stone on memo? You do it. You got to work your if way. You have out. the reputation if yeah. you've established your bona fides. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a good, it's a good point. 
and and it's something still i mean we i've seen stones moving around bangkok that way i've seen stones moving around even in the tucson show that way you know it's yes. kind of like after the show come in the hotel room don't tell anybody you saw this i'm just showing it to a few people and it, that's still yes. pretty much happens regularly um okay so changing it up a little bit this is one of the questions from nikki novello she asked you know for the new generation you because you're you, you know you're you're in the generation before me maybe even two i don't know how you define you're trying it. To say i'm a i'm a dinosaur is no, that no, you're you an mean? elder you're an elder That's what... <laughs> all right so we got we're getting the wisdom from the elders I, here I, I, all right i appreciate that but for the next generation like for mine or <laughs> even the people that are going to come later yeah do you think that the, the trade is still is it still a sustainable you know is there still a model that's sustainable in the 21st century for the gem trade yeah i, I think so uh gemstones have been valued since the beginning of civilization and probably long before i mean people have decorated themselves we can trace that back um, 120,000 years yeah um, and so the desire has always been there and I don't see it's the, you know, a beautiful stone is still a beautiful stone. A rare stone is still a rare stone. And if someone wants that, it's gotta be somebody who can uh, supply it to them. And that's what the trade is about. Yeah. And do you think f for, from your own experience, do you think the retail model still works? Is it still the best way or would you do it differently if you were 30 years old right now? Uh, it would be, uh, it would be more difficult. That's for sure. I mean, uh, with, with the changes that I outlined previously, uh, it would be more difficult to do. I mean, I started my business with $129. Yeah. I mean, it's a capital intensive business. How in the world, the $129 I used to get, uh, uh, a chunk of silver that had been delivered to the post office COD because I didn't have the credit. Uh, uh, so I had to, uh, so I had to buy COD and it was 129 bucks. Whereas that's back when silver was $4 an ounce. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yes, it's, it's much, it'd be, it, there are other, there are challenges, but you know, there are also ways to adapt to new challenges. And, you know, the, the market still, the quality market still is very, very small. I mean, yeah. I would not want to try to start a jewelry chain in the United States selling the usual crap uh, and trying to make, make a living selling diamonds because the margins on diamonds have dropped from Keystone to about 15%, mm -hmm. as far as I'm aware colorless diamonds again I'm talking about but if you're dealing in the rare and the beautiful but then so but my advice to, to I guess my advice to the young generation is be a real jeweler yeah a real jeweler somebody who deals in beauty yeah somebody who is a craftsman someone who creates a product that people will not only love but will uh, will be passed down through the generations and be and be appreciated a hundred years from now. Yeah, I know one of the things that I thought about before, you know, from the point of view of a cutter, is uh, you know sometimes I see some very very old stones, you know, like from Roman Roman jewelry or, or Egyptian jewelry that has stones in it, you know, of some sort, not faceted, but you know, some sort of gemstone. And I just think, wow, okay, this is 500 or 1,000 or 1,500 years old. Some gem cutter sometime sat down and cut that stone, and I'm looking at it still today, 1,500 years later. You don't know who the guy was or the, or the woman. You don't know who it was, but the, the work lasts. And I think you're spot on here. Um, if you can put in the quality and you can make something that will last, then your work will outlive you. And, um, you know, even if your name's not remembered forever, your piece can be, or your, or your work can be.
And so for me, that, to me as a gem cutter, this is so inspiring because I know gems are gems do last forever. I mean, really, until someone mm -hmm. recuts it, your signature is on the stone. My signature, particularly. So I gems find are that, some of the most durable things on earth. Yeah, yeah. And uh, as you say, uh, people have been cutting them since they've been pulling stream pebbles uh, out of streams and and polishing them up. And that was the first cut. That's the cabochon. Yeah, exactly. And um, some of those still exist and they're still beautiful. Uh, so you said that you started your business with $129. Somebody had asked, what do you think is the minimum capital to set up? You think it's still, you think $129 is still possible? I think you need 135 at least today. You know, I, <laughs> well, I, I know. Uh, I, when well, I, we did have a workbench and we did yeah. have tools. So I guess, you, need that you know, first. I guess we had um, more than that. Uh, so you would need a workbench, right? You would need the tools. You need a flex shaft. Uh, it would be great if you're set in color to have a, to have a, a laser welder because uh, if you make the mistake, uh, uh, you can correct it with a laser welder. But if you don't have one, you got to take every stone out before you, you put it to mm -hmm. the torch. Uh, but it can be done modestly, yeah. Um, and, and then you need if, stones. If Oh, you certainly need money. Yeah. Um, well, I know for I, me, I will. When, I, when I came out to Bangkok, this is now like almost four years ago, I had a fasting machine and I had about $500 in cash after I finished my GIA bill. And that's how I started. So I think still it's, you know, you, know, you need to figure, like you said, you need to figure out your niche. You need to figure out your angle. You need to figure yeah. out what you're going to do and what, who your customers are going to be, which is not the easiest thing to figure out, but. Well, how I much did the fasting machine cost? Yeah, I mean, that was already a couple thousand dollars, but I, you yeah, know. It's a 2,500. Yeah, <laughs> and then, you know, but G, and then G, GIA is pretty expensive as well for, yeah. a, as a business expense, but. Um, That's the way to do it, by the way. I wish I could do it over and go to Bangkok and get my FGA. And then, and then go to work for a, a gem dealer and learn how to cut because yeah. then I know everything. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. After I mean, reading my own book, that is. Yeah. Now it's easy. Cause yeah, now we can read secrets of the gem trade. It's easy. Well, there you go. You got secrets of gem trade. You go to, you get your FGA or your G or your GG and, and learn about rough. That's real important. Learn about rough. Well, and, you know, our idea for the school that we started, I mean, this fits exactly into what you're saying. When I came out here to do school, I was, and I knew Bangkok was a cutting hub. So I, I thought in my mind, in the nights and weekends when I'm not doing GIA, I'm going to do, even though I was already a gem cutter, I was like, I'm going to try and do a gem cutting school while I'm there. Like, you know, take some classes from the Thai cutters. And I was really surprised to find that there wasn't, I couldn't find any cutting class there wasn't anything like that here um and so when we decided to start the school that was exactly our idea there's people here that are coming for the trade there's people here that are coming for school they want to know about rough and none of the schools teach about rough they want to know about cutting because they want to know about rough so if we can do a rough class and we can do a cutting class we can probably do pretty good and it was a pretty good idea it's working but um yeah, I couldn't really believe yeah, you're right. None of those, those resources existed before. So, you know, you're the next step after, uh, after you get the, or, or you're the first step before you get the G, the GG. Yeah, either way. I, I think either way. GG first is good because then you understand your crystallography and, and your species and stuff like that. But yeah, you know, I mean, I think learning cutting is really important for anybody because you can't understand rough at all without understanding at least a little bit of how you cut works and the, what they teach you in gemology school doesn't really make any sense until you've actually put your hands on the wheel and done it yourself at least once. I and spent a couple of days with a cutter once and cut a couple of stones. You know, that was about all. I, I wish I had spent more time, but uh, you can only do so many things. Yeah, that's true. I, I like showing people cutting because it, it opens people's eyes to how hard it is and it gives people a new respect for, for cut 
whether it's a good cut and they recognize, oh, this is a good cut, that's great. Or they recognize it's a bad cut, but maybe they can be a little bit more sympathetic to why it's bad because cutting is quite hard when you don't have the right tools. And most, you know, some people who are in major cutting centers still don't have modern tools. So who knows? Knowledge but, uh, is the most valuable thing you can acquire. If you've got yeah. the knowledge, you can take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's pop up a few photos. I know you've already told, some, told us some good stories, but you've sent me some photos that we can look at. So maybe we'll just, you don't have to tell us a long story for each photo, but just give us, a, so we can see some visual stuff from, from sure. some, some of the adventures that you've been on over the years. So you'll have to, uh, you'll have to navigate these because I don't know anything. That's my wife, Rebecca, and I at a, at a jade shop in Guangzhou, I think it's pronounced, in China. Uh, okay. we, we went with Richard Hughes uh, on a, a trip from the, we were in the Hong Kong Gem Show, and we went from there by train and uh, looked at a lot of jade. I mean, okay. jade, is, jade is a very difficult stone, and uh, it took me from 2001 to 2016 to feel competent to write an article on J jade which became uh, the chapter uh, in the book and i have a picture of you and richard as well richard. there we are yeah i love noodle soup this is in china yeah every every uh, country in asia has their own noodle soup it's very yeah. inexpensive and you can live on it yeah it's true and so i frequently <laughs> did and then what's going on here? Well, I'm just uh, working on a, uh, an article or I'm working on the book. I think this is taken in Mexico to, to finish uh, the second edition of Secrets of the Gem Trade. I spent three months in Mexico uh, and uh, my wife only was there for the first week and the last week. And I spent all the time uh, working on the second edition. Okay. And then here we, it looks like we're looking at Mines? Uh, yeah, that's a tourmaline mine. Well, I think they were looking for aqua too in, um, in Minas Gerais, uh, Brazil, pr probably north of Teoflo Otoni, which used to be a, a major gem buying hub. And I'm, I'm not sure that you, you would characterize it that way today. Okay. And then what are we looking at here? Well, I went to Montana. Um, and to do an article for, I was, uh, I was geomology uh, uh, columnist for National Jeweler Magazine. And I went up to uh, American Gem Corporation in Montana. This was one of the, for a while, a very big deal in the gem trade. They had raised something like $18 million on the Canadian Stock Exchange. Wow. And they were buying up uh, all of the, a lot of uh, gem bearing uh, land uh, in and around Gem Mountain in the Colorado River, which, you know, there's lots of sapphire up there. And uh, so I went up there to do an article and then I, uh, he, I was actually hired to be a consultant. Uh, so I spent some time up there training their sorters. They had 13 sorters uh, sorting like three and a half million uh, individual tiny uh sapphires and i and i tr i spent a week training them okay and then what about this one this looks this looks just from the quality of the photo this looks pretty old 90s or yeah this is an old one this was taken in the queensland outback okay this is a miner shack uh in uh, uh out by opleton okay which is about uh well, you, you go in 350 miles to Winton, and from Winton you drive for about 10 hours okay. over dirty, dusty roads to get to so Mainside and to Opleton. So not, not too sophisticated then. Is this the same place, or this is a different? No, that's you're back at, in Montana. That's American Gem Corporation. Okay. Uh, I had my picture uh, switched. They, they process pot, lots and lots of rock because – the gem gravel is very rich there, but okay. they're all tabular, tabular uh, alluvial materi material. But you could take a bucket and you might get a double handful of uh, small sapphires. But unfortunately, they average roughly cut like a three millimeter round. Oh, okay. So that's too bad. 
And then <laughs> now we're back in uh, the Winton, Australia, at a cutting shop. Okay, so these are uh, the opals getting ready to be. Yeah, these are boulder opals on the dop sticks being cut. And then what about this? This is a great shot. Well, that uh, the driver there is Campbell Bridges, okay, the famous uh, sovereign miner who was, uh, you know, un unfortunately killed uh, actually by a spear uh, in in Voy, Kenya. And this is Voy, and this is uh, this is his uh, sovereign mine. Okay. And uh, the passenger, I, I don't know, the black guy is a miner, and that's my wife Rebecca sitting in the cart going down into the attic okay and then and then what's going on here back in the uh, main side at a uh, opal mining uh, uh, area owned by vince everett was the name it looks I'm like i'm trying to remember the name of the mine but that uh we were inside the shack at 6 30 in the morning i came well, i remember coming out and it was 120 degrees wow. in march Jeez. And then it started to get hot after that. <laughs> and where are we at here? Uh, yeah, we keep bouncing around. That's uh, Brazil again. Okay. And then this one looks like they're getting ready to do some cutting. There's Brazil, uh, uh, a modern cutting shop in Brazil. This fellow, Joe, Joe Crescenzi, ran it, and it was very modern. And uh, he cut precision stones back when nobody was cutting precision stones in Brazil, in Teofilo Tony, Brazil. Okay. And then who are we looking at here? Well, that's uh, my first dealer, Barry Hodgen. Barry lived in Bangkok. And uh, I got, a, I got a, a reference to him from a client who came in my shop who he was related to. So when I went on my first trip to Bangkok, I needed, you know, to find people to see. And then he was the one, one of the people I, I found. And then later he and I went on a buying, couple of buying trips to Brazil. So the guy on the right is me and the guy in the middle is Barry and the guy on the left is, uh, is one of the brokers. Okay. And we can see you, uh, you hadn't turned gray yet. You were still uh, dark haired. Yeah, I was, I was just a young lad. Days. And then this one's cool. Also another old looking one. Monahi Island, Tuamoto Archipelago, uh, taken in 1986 at a pearl farm called Kata Kata. And maybe this is from the same place? Yeah. Yeah, that's a black pearl oyster. Okay. On so the you, half shell. So you they were opening them right in front of you and were you able to pull They were opening them well that mostly they were implanting them. Oh, okay. Oh, it was a farm. Uh, but yeah, at the farm. And so I watched the implanting process. And then where are we at here? Upper Thailand, near the Burma border, you know, May Sot, I think. Okay. So this is a, I don't See, know. I'm how... a, little gray, a little grayer there, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The time's going by. Yeah. And... Now that's the road from Winton, Australia to Mainside, the to the opal mines. Okay. okay. So that shows you what it was like. I mean, yeah. it's like pretty the road to nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> just dirt roads. And this is another one in China looking at maybe yeah. looking at Jade. Looking at, yeah, looking at uh looking at uh Jade, right? And then I saw I put a few together on this one, just a bunch of different mining shots. These are all taken in uh um at an emerald mine in Colombia. The one on the left, I believe, is the Lapita mine. The middle one is me in the Consorcio mine, which is part of the same complex. And the third one is also down in, uh, down in the Consorcio mine. Cool. So you really have seen most of the, it Burma. seems like you've seen most of the uh, mining regions of the world. I haven't been to Madagascar. I'd like to go to Madagascar. Uh, I, I don't know how things are going in Mozambique now, but I'd like to go there as well. Yeah. Where are we at here? Burma. Okay. That's just, you know, that's, that's in, I think it's in Mogok, uh, in the gem. Okay. I, I got to go to 
to Mogok just after they reopened it. You know, it was closed in 1962. That's the ruby mining region of Burma. Yeah. And it didn't reopen, or, and it began to reopen sporadically in the early 90s. And I went up uh, there with uh, one of the major ruby dealers in Bangkok, uh, Joseph Belmont of KV Gems. He took me with him. And uh, that's a photo I took there. Okay. And then... Maasai warrior, Tanzania. That's a great one too. With a spear in the ground. Yep. Wow. This is a, this is a, uh, this is a miners market in Colombia. Uh, miners generally work on shares down there. I think they get a small stipend, mm -hmm. but at the end of each shift, one of them is given Oh, you might call it the tailings of, of what, what they found, usually small crystals or small pieces of rough emerald as part of their portion. And uh, they all then go and sell them once, one day a week at this mining, at this cliffside uh, uh, in, in uh, uh, I'm trying to remember the name, of the, the name of the province where all the mines are, but anyway. So I'm there buying little pieces of rough okay. emerald. That's cool. And then here I just put a few together from different- Same thing, these are all taken in Colombia. Okay, cool. Yeah, so yeah, you, uh, just to get some visual flair so we can kind of see some of the places you've been to, it looks like just really, really diverse and beautiful places. It's, it seems like you've had a pretty um, full career in terms of oh, it was a lot of fun i mean that was the best part of it if i hadn't been able to travel um i probably would have moved on at some point and not yeah. stayed in the trade but the traveling and the buying um uh, i only went to warm places i don't like cold places okay so Russia luckily was most most of the gems in the world come from warm places yeah. so i and in the winter you know, January and February and March are the worst times in the gem and jewelry business. So I would go, I usually go to Tucson first, check out the price structure, and then go to Asia, Africa, South America, and try to beat it. Yeah. Okay, this one just popped into the chat, but it's a good question for what we're talking about right now. Have you had any security issues with all these travel experiences? Any problems? Any danger? Uh... Nothing major, no. So that's pretty lucky then, because um, I've heard. I've. I, yeah, well, I think it's important to see. I would make. I would make a. I would usually in Tucson. I would find someone. A reputable dealer from that area. Okay. And I would say to them, "Look, would you be my broker? I'm happy to pay, pay the brokerage percentage. I mean, if I liked them and I had a rapport with them." I'd set up, set that up, and then I would go to see them. I would sit in their uh, office, and often they'd feel, you know, responsible for me. Mm -hmm. um, That's a good way. I also trained in martial arts for twenty years. Okay, so if, but I never had, to, I never had to to use anything. Yeah. Uh, but I was trying to keep in shape. Uh, sh should I, should I run into a problem? But I found that. I didn't do stupid things. You know, you can get in trouble anywhere. You can get in trouble in Lenox, Massachusetts or New York City or Bangkok if you do stupid things. <laughs> so you want to, you want to be, you got to be sensible. Yeah. And if you're going to do something with somebody, make sure it's somebody you trust, preferably somebody you've established a relationship, preferably somebody who's it's in their interest to keep you safe because you're buying stuff from them. Yeah, no, that's true. It's and, that, true. and that works very well. Okay, so let me get back to a few more of the questions in the Q&A. Uh, you, you mentioned this already, but we'll mention it again. Uh, someone asked, do you have electronic versions of your books? You said that you have Kindle versions for everything, right? Or, no, I mean, uh, there's a Kindle sorry. version of the French Blue, but not of uh, Secret. Not of Secret to the Gym Tree. So that one, but that one, you don't really want it as an ebook because when you see the, well, I mean, no. especially if you get the hardcover version, when you see what's inside, you know, it's full of colorful photos and diagram. I'm not showing this very well, but you know, it's full of pictures. And you All the photographs were by professional photographers, some of the best photographers in the world. 
uh, and I spent a lot of money making sure the reproduction was perfect. Now, if you're going to judge a gemstone, you got to be able to see it. So what I put in secrets was were examples of the finer qualities of top 5% of gems in the world. Yeah. So if you're going to read the article, read the chapter, you got to have that gem to look at. Yeah. Reference and point. frankly, Kindle books with illustrations are awful. Yeah. I would never buy a Kindle book with an, with illustrations. Yeah. I guess there must be a format where you could do it, but you're right. It's best to have the physical book. I just and, got a Kindle last year. I love the Kindle for reading, but yeah, when the, the, the images are always usually just line drawings. I don't, obviously you can't have colors. So there's kind of pointless to have a picture of a Sapphire on a Kindle because it doesn't look like anything, but the text for the text, the Kindles I think is great. Um, well, the quality of the photography has improved so much in the last two or three decades. Yeah, that's true. That too. you can, you know, if you spend the money, you can get very good reproduction of these photographs. Yeah. Uh, and I have Hammond photographs. I have uh, a number of a, a very important photographers. Jeff Scoville, I suppose, is yeah. re is more representative than any other photographer uh, in the book. I know when uh, we were, I, yeah. Well, I was going to say I know that when when I was speaking with Richard Hughes on on here a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about how how hard it is to try and get the photo to look like the real stone because some colors sure. just aren't they're not printable. You know, they don't fall into the realm of printers. So um, it is very tricky to try and to to, to try and get a perfect uh, representation. Uh, one That's person, the other problem with with grading systems. Yeah, you know what is if you use if you use paint chips as a basis for your grading system, uh, print media cannot produce uh, colors that are comparable to translucent transparent media. Yeah. Simply can't be done. And then when you so talk, you about, always lose something in yeah. in print. And then when you talk about pleochroic stones, you know the the way that two colors merge together, even two stones that are from the same place can look totally different just by how the two color, you know, the the c axis yeah. and the a b axis color are, are blending, and how it's cut. Yeah. Of course, the cut changes your whole impression of that color. Uh, one person asked, in your in Secrets of the Gem Trade, do you cover? Um, transportation of gems and talking about like local regulations how do you how do you import them and export them no no that's... secrets of the gem trade is a book about quality grading and connoisseurship okay um if you want if you want the nuts and bolts uh, you know the really the best way is is to do what i did uh, if you want to go to bangkok uh, set up a relationship with uh, justin Prim, or someone, uh, Vincent Pardue, or uh, a dealer that uh, you have uh, faith in, and go and ask questions. Yeah. Uh, transportation is not a problem anymore. No, I mean, there's so, there are, yeah. there's so many international shipping places, like any of yeah. the big, and then if you need super security that we've got several gem oriented shipping companies now anyway it's it's pretty much once yeah, i've had million dollar gems shipped to me yeah uh it can be done yeah sometimes it comes down to a courier yeah. comes in your shop with a gun in his, in his belt with a pistol in his belt but <laughs> yeah and all the major gem shows uh usually fedex is there um there's another um there's another shipping company that's specifically in new york specifically related to gems i'm trying to remember the name of it and i can't mm. but you might be able to um is um, it um and also the dealers bangkok dealers for example they know how to get the stuff to you yeah you know they, that's, I mean, that's their business that's usually the case i mean even when there is some problem with getting stuff across country lines the people in those places like for instance burma there's people coming from burma to bangkok all the time you know, um, we just sort of don't ask the questions about how they do that, how they're getting the stones around. But, you know, 
when I, when I wanted to get my Burmese handpiece, I, I messaged my friend and then it was in Bangkok four days later. I was like, how did you do that? You know, somebody was already coming or whatever. I don't know, but yeah. It was yeah. There. Well, you know, uh, one, uh, my first dealer said to me once, uh, very early in my career, he said, if you're in the gem business, you're in the smuggling business. That's true. And I'll just leave it at that yeah. without explication. That hasn't changed. I think that, you know, whatever. Um, well, when I you... remember it, in those days in Bangkok, you had to go through like 24 different steps to, to uh, legally export. It was absurd. Nobody did it. Now I don't know what the situation is. But... I don't know. It's got, yeah, it's, it, Thailand loves bureaucracy. It's complicated. Um, but somebody had asked, whenever you were doing these trips and you said you were leaving for a few months at a time, how, how long would you actually leave your store? And would you have someone there running it while you were gone or did it close or what? No, I, for a long time I had a partner who ran it while I was gone. But usually uh, in a resort area in January, February, and March, I mean, you know, you can go to, out in the main street and take a nap <laughs> if you want because nobody's going to be driving down that street. Okay. Um, so all that downtime was a was a was a net negative, of course, but it was also a positive because it gave me the leeway. It gave me the time to go for to East Africa for a month, or to go to Eder Oberstein for two weeks, and then go to East Africa, then yeah. come to London, spend a few days, and then yeah, back to the United States. Yeah, that. Would you? Yeah. Would you buy and sell as you were going, like, or would you just buy and buy and buy and only sell back in the states? Like, did you would you sell to somebody in London if you had the chance? I suppose I would have, but I never, never attempted to. Okay. I was always buying. Okay. I, I wanted. I was vertically integrated. I wanted to buy at the source and sell to the retail consumer because that gave you a tremendous uh, profit, potentially anyway yeah and you know you had to pay for a month's trip and so forth so uh, uh you know i didn't really want to waste my time trying to sell stuff i don't really like itinerant selling you know i, I would never be an itinerant gem dealer and go <laughs> to stores and sit there for two and a half hours while uh, while the, the buyer talks to everybody else in the world because he's had a, he you know woke up on the wrong side of the bed he's had a bad day and he takes it out on you yeah, and I never, <clears throat> I never appreciated that myself. So uh, I didn't do it to people who came to see me, and uh, I did have a wholesale partner for a while who did just that. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I didn't like the wholesale business really. Yeah. Well, we spoke a lot about you know the secrets of the gym trade and and kind of how you got to the point where you were ready to to write that book. Let's just spend a few minutes talking about the French Blue because this is a totally different kind of a of, of a book. It's fiction. Um, yeah. How did you get to that point? You know, I mean, what what gave you the idea to write uh, a, a fiction book based on a historical character and, of course, on this famous stone? Where the where where did you get the idea from? Well, uh, I've always wanted to write, so. Once I get finished with Secrets of the Gem Trade, I said, well, okay, I've done that. Now I'd like to do fiction. I'd like to do a novel. And I was buying, you know, I've been a book collector since the beginning. And I was, I had an opportunity to buy a copy of Tavernier's book. It was the Oxford edition. It was the second translator's first edition, Valentine Ball's edition. Okay. I think it's an 1889 edition. But not only was it the edition, it was Valentine's Ball's personal copy. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Right? And it had all his no notes in it. Wow. When he died, he bequeathed his copy to William Crook. Okay. And William Crook wrote, uh, edited his edition and published what was the second edition okay. of the second translator. And it had all of his notes, plus the letters he had sent to all of these people asking questions like, where in the hell is this place that Tavernier is talking about? And I was able to buy it from a Canadian dealer for nothing, basically, cheap. And I got it in my hand and I said to myself, 
you know, this is interesting. There's Tavernier, then there was Valentine Ball, a great gemologist and writer. Then there was William Crook, also the author of some wonderful books. And now I have it. That's a special book. So shouldn't I write the story, Tavernier's story for the modern reader? Isn't that, and it wouldn't that, won't that be interesting? You're supposed to write what you know. That's what Tamingway said. So I knew the gem trade. I traveled as Tavernier did. I've been to some of the same places that he went. So couldn't I get inside his head and write a novel which had some authenticity and integrity to it? Yeah. And I could sprinkle in some of the, some of the secrets of the gem trade. Yeah, you know, which I had discovered in reading his original work, and so, so that was the reason. And so maybe let's let's sum up to Vernier because maybe some people haven't read him or haven't heard of him. Um, you want to give us a just a quick idea about who he was and and why he was important? Yeah, between 1630 and 1668, Jean Baptiste Tavernier made six voyages from France to Persia and India. He traveled uh, 180,000 miles, I think, in total. He went further than Magellan, and he did it as a French gem dealer. He went to these places, he bought and he sold, and he bought and sold as he went, too, by the way. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Six Voyages, in which he outlined uh, in some cases, and went into great deal in detail in others about the things that he saw and the things that he did on those six voyages. And you can buy the book in a uh, in a modern translation, in Indian translation, very inexpensively. Um, and so it's chock full of very interesting information and background. And, uh, you know, I, I sort of thought to myself, gee, I'm kind of a modern version of Tavernier. I'm doing the same things he did. Although, think about it, six major trips in the 17th century. Yeah. This is he, he endured things which, uh, which I never, I mean, he would travel with 50 or 100 people. He'd have camels. He'd have elephants. He'd have guards. Uh, so... It was very, very interesting. And he talks about the diamond dealers. He talks about the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company. He talks about where you can find various gems. He talks about the difference between spinel and ruby. Um, talks about what the finest pearls look like. Uh, he tells a story. He said the finest pearl is in the, is in the collection of a prince of Muscat. And it's not the finest pearl on, the, on account of its perfect roundness or on account of its whiteness and lack of, uh, not inclusion, but, but uh, defects. Defects. But because if you hold it up to the light, you can almost see light through it. In other words, it's translucent. And that is the finest pearl in the world. Now, of course, cultured pearls were the big, opaque shell bead in them never see that can't be thought of in that way although there still is a translucency to the pearl and that's where you get the overtones and what is called orient yeah and that's part of the romance of the pearl so if you're selling pearls those are the things you better know about yeah and if you can tell tavernier's story even better and you've got a pearl it kind of looks like it. well so, he, so so basically he was he was not the first but definitely one of the great gem hunters of history um mm -hmm. and and maybe he was so great because or at least for us now he was so great because he left us such a good record or at least a record of what he did we don't have very many other kinds of you know documentation of gem traveling merchants like this from especially from that well, yeah i mean if you read books about the 17th century of the mogok or not mogok uh, Mog the mogul dynasty of india or persia you'll find uh footnotes footnoting tavernier 
because he was also a very good cultural historian and anthropologist. He was a great observer and he described the things that he saw. So uh, um, anthropologists, historians uh, have found his work very useful and accurate. Okay. And so when you were doing your research and getting ready to write the book, did you just read Tavernier or did you have to read a lot of other background material to understand the world that he was existing in? Oh, I don't know, maybe 50 books. Okay. I read uh, Richelieu appears in the narrative. I read one or two biographies of him. He was the, uh, he was, uh, uh, he was the, I guess you would call him the, the, grand, the grand vizier of, uh, of Louis XIV. Okay. Cardinal Mazarin, who was his successor. Yeah. I read about the great mogul, Shah Jahan, who uh, lived in India at the time and Tavernier talked to and met with. Um, and also books on the Mughals, books on the French at that period, political histories of the, of the, uh, of the period, mm. 30 years war, for example. Yeah. which defined uh, that period in history. So yeah, did a lot of research, even though most of what I wrote were, were takeoffs on T Tavernier's own uh, adventures, you know, but Tavernier never had dial. He didn't, there was no dialogue in the six voyages. So I yeah. brought him to life. He yeah. tells the story, his own story in the French political. And of course, I had no, I had to make up the dialogue. Yeah. And I mean, I think you did a good job, you know, I mean, it's really readable, it's entertaining. And for me, it's perfect because I want, you know, I haven't tried to read Tavernier yet. I'm sure that I will soon, but I don't know how readable, sure. I don't know how readable it really is, but this reads like a, it's thrilling, you know, it's a, it's got, it's like a action and adventure and gemstones and, you know, just the kind of thing you'd want to read and of an adventure novel about yeah his book is interesting he's uh, this is the style of writing in the 17th century was a little i would call tedious mm -hmm. uh and uh, you'll you'll find uh you'll find some interesting turns of phrase that we wouldn't use today but the language uh was not so different in the 17th century so you'll be able to read it and if you're interested in gems, I think you'll find it uh, worth worth uh, getting into. Yeah. And so, okay, that was your second book, and now you're now you said you've been in retirement for a few years now, and a couple yeah. people have already asked this question, but I wanted to ask it as well. Are you working on more books? Is there has have ha, do you have a current project right now? Well, I've just, uh, um, my latest book has just come out. It's called Redlined. Okay. It's a uh, mystery thriller. It has okay. nothing to do with gemstones, sorry to say. But it's set in Boston in the 70s, and it's, uh, it, it chronicles to some degree the org community organizing work I did in Boston in that period, although it's all fictionalized. Um, it deals with redlining which is very much in the news these days. Okay. Um, and I'm working now on a book that's set in central from France 32,000 years ago. I call it a prehistorical novel. Okay. Well, what's the idea behind that one? Well, I've always been fascinated by the cave paintings in France and in and, and Northern Spain, mm -hmm. particularly the ones at Chauvet. Mm -hmm. uh, if you look at those paintings uh, and the quality and the sophistication of them, it's impossible to believe that the people who painted those things were primitives who could only scratch under their arms and grunt. Yeah. They were very people very much like us. Uh, the only difference is uh, it was a prehistoric situation, so nobody wrote down their story. So I'm going back 32,000 years and, um, and trying to bring their story to life. Okay. That sounds interesting. It's a totally different kind of a concept. Do well, you, you know, 50,000 years ago, well, for 200,000 years, the Neanderthals owned Europe. They were the only human species that were, was in Europe. 
-hmm. 50,000 years ago, modern Homo sapiens arrived. 5,000 years later, the Neanderthals were extinct. Okay. How do what how, how does that exp, how do you explain that? Yeah. So well, that, that's that's the theme of the book. Sounds cool. What you, happened to him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm sure as you flesh it out, uh, or when you flesh it out, we'll get a chance to find out from your point of view what did happen. Yeah. Meanwhile, Redline has just come out. It's available in Kindle. It's available in paperback, and it's available as an Audible book. It's my first Audible book. Oh, so I cool. found a, uh, I found a, uh, a voice actor. He's from, he's lives in Los Angeles, but he's from Boston, Massachusetts. So he narrates the book in his Boston accent, which oh, really makes awesome. it, I think, gives it some authenticity. And you can buy that at Audible. Cool. That's uh, so cool. Or on, or on Amazon or. Yeah. I'm a huge audio book guy. I've always dreamed that one day when I do my book, there'll be an audio book version of it. So I guess I'll have to pick your brain on how to do it once, once I'm ready to do that. Sure. Ho cool. Hopefully I'll be around long enough. Yeah. Well, no, a couple of years, <laughs> not far. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Don't, don't take too, don't take too long. And so, so the, so Redline then is kind of going back to before your time in the gym trade and in, in more of the political activism work and social organizing and, you know, I was a political activist for, I was a community organizer for almost 10 years. And I worked with community groups. I worked with tenant unions, building tenant unions. I worked with welfare rights organizations. And in Boston, I organized the neighborhood and the neighborhood was redlined. It was a beautiful neighborhood, but the banks had decided, oh, well, we're not gonna lend money there. Mm -hmm. Well, that caused the housing market to crash. So that the people who owned homes in that area, their their properties went to zero because you know if you're going to sell a home, you've got to be able to get a mortgage because 95% of all properties are transferred with mortgages. So you, if mortgage isn't available, basically your property is worthless, yeah. or what a cash buyer will pay, and usually that meant blockbusters and slumlords. Okay. And once that happened. It only took about a generation, 20 years, to take a viable neighborhood and turn it into a slum. Okay. So, uh, so this is stopping the... redlining was very important, and uh, we were successful in Boston doing it, and it tells the story of how it was done. Plus, it introduces another, uh, another plot line, which allowed me to put in some murder and mayhem. Okay. You know, uh, so keep I, it I, you know, so I'll... I'll so it's a thriller. It's a mystery thriller. Basically. Interesting. Okay. That's, that's a totally different thing. So yeah. do you think that there's any, you know, as far as going back to writing for the gem trade, do you think there's anything else that you still need to say? Like for instance, one, one, uh, one of our questionnaires had asked, will you ever do like a secrets of the retail store or the retail trade? You know, is there more that you need to say from your experience or have you said everything that you needed to say about the gem trade in the second edition of Secrets of the Gem Trade. Yes, I think I have. I mean, I'm not re interested in producing a manual for retailers. There's plenty of them. Mm. And there's plenty of people who, uh, you know, or organizations that go out and train people to be retailers. Uh, they tend to work with formulas and I tend to be anti-formula. Okay. I mean, I, there are only, there's only one rule and that is there are no rules. True. Make your I mean, own you rules. can follow a formula and, and have a modicum or even a, a major success, but you won't have as much fun. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think. When you retired, did you close the store? Did, did you pass it on to somebody else? Well, I did both. Uh, I had a big going out of business sale, brought in a company, a liquidator, and we did fabulously well. And then I... Uh, my former partner was interested in getting back into business. So I basically sold what was left to, to my partner, former okay. partner. Okay. So let me pose you one more question and then everything else that's uh, in there was usually about uh, asking for your uh, contact info, which I'm about to pop up. But I guess this will be our closing question because we're about just over two hours now. Um, from your experience- how many, people are you, how many people are still on? We still have 30 people in here, so we're, we're, we're still... Uh, so we're, there's some attrition. 
Yeah, no, it's okay. We're How still many up. did we have at the? Uh, at I the think peak? we started. We started with about sixty. So maybe uh, some people fell asleep. For uh, for for yeah. me, it's getting a little bit late. For you, I know it's still. Yeah, two time. hours is a long time to do yeah. anything. But okay. But from your experience, you know, as a traveler, as a jeweler, as a gem trader, as a business owner, what's what's your advice for the new person coming in? What's the what's the newbie? Um, recommendation from Richard Wise? Be, pay your bills on time and be alert for opportunities. Okay, keep it simple. I, mean, so it, I answered that question in many other ways. For yeah, no, I, I, I think you've had two hours of answering that question, but it's always nice to just, to sum it up. So let me and just- do something you enjoy. Yeah, oh, for sure. I think that's one of the luxuries of our business is we get to really, for one, we get to look at beautiful things all day. For two, we get to, um, we get to interact with really wonderful people pretty much all the time. That's been my experience in, in the gym trade. So I think we're pretty blessed in that sense. Um, so yeah, Richard, I want to thank you for being here to the audience. Oh, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun. I appreciate being invited and, uh, getting a chance to uh to interact with uh, your uh, your audience i really yeah, enjoyed myself it's it's always good to to try and get behind the um the mind of some of the most influential books that we've read and, and of course secrets of the gem trade is one of those books so now we can have a little idea about who you know who you are behind the author so uh, i know a few people have asked this already um how do you get in touch with Richard or, or how do you buy the books? Uh, he's got a website for Secrets of the Gym Trade. He's got a website for the French Blue. Um, on social media, he's up on Facebook. So if you guys want to find the, the gym secrets there, those are the ways. Yeah, and, and basically you can order. Uh, a red Line has just come out, so you might have a little difficulty finding it. Uh, but Red Line can be found on Kindle, on Amazon. And, uh, and basically on smashwords.com. In other words, it's available in every e-format. Okay. But uh, the French Blue and Secrets of the Gem Trade, you should be able to buy anywhere. Yeah. It's distributed by National Book Marketing and it's, uh, it's available anywhere. You can order it through your local bookstore. Yeah. And I think I'll just put my two cents here. If you're going to order Secrets of the Gem Trade, go for the hardcover. We've got both of them in the house and I think the hardcover is the quality is better so and if you're a, if you're a book collector then it's better anyway just get the hardcover there's also a, a limited edition you can buy oh and I mean, you get a free french blue if you buy that okay well that's even better so you can get two two for one okay a twofer. so I, i'm sure at this point you guys are following me following the school because i've already said this about nine other times uh join us next week it's going to be the last week uh, that I'm going to do the Sunday conversations. I'm going to team up with Lauren Volivar from the Gemology Worldwide podcast, who is a tutor nerd. I'm a tutor nerd. So we're going to talk about gems and jewelry and gem cutting in the Tudor England period. So we're going to team up for a nice presentation that way. Um, and then after next week, I've got a new series that I'm going to start up in, in after a couple of weeks of break. So, uh, it's not the end, but it, well, we're gonna we're gonna do something new after this, a, a different format. So, um, thanks everybody for being here once again. Catch catch me next week with Lauren. R catch Richard on uh, his website or on Facebook, and um, yeah, thank you again, Richard. It was a blast. Just all right. Take take next, care. Next time Goodbye I'm invited, everyone. I'm gonna have to come say hi, in person. Ah, good. Okay. Look forward to it. So see you Take later. Care. Signing off here in Bangkok. Bye-bye.